A warm welcome from Trinity Business School uh, to this special webinar uh, celebrating the publication of the current issue of Business Ethics Quarterly, a special issue focusing on deliberative democracy and CSR. A special welcome uh, goes to uh, the former and current editor-in-chief of BEQ, Bruce Berry and Frank, Frank de Hont, uh, who are here with us, as well as all the authors and guest editors of this special issue. So it's great to have you all uh, with, uh, with us here in this uh, virtual room. Um, and thanks for um, making time on a Friday morning or afternoon for this. Um, so my name is Max Schoermeyer, and I'm an assistant professor in business ethics at Trinity Business School. And as a member of the guest editorial team uh, of the special issue, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to host this webinar today. Um, the publication of the issue brings um, a multi-year-long process to an end. Uh, and so we felt it's a good idea to celebrate this moment uh, with the publication in February and bring all the authors together and the interested community together to share their insights uh, about uh, uh, recent research on deliberative democracy and CSR. So today the webinar will uh, go down as follows. We have a few uh, introductory remarks uh, before each author team or single author um, has 10 minutes uh, to talk about the key insights um, of their paper. Um, and then we have a few minutes, around 15 minutes left uh, for a joint uh, discussion and closing uh, of the session. Uh, it is recorded, so it can be, it can be accessed um, also uh, probably sometime next week, um, particularly for those who could not join us uh, today in the live session. Um, so now uh, I'm happy to hand over uh, to uh, Bruce Berry, the former editor-in-chief of BEQ and uh, the person who uh, allowed us um, um, to pursue this special issue. So Bruce, over to you. Well, thank you, Max. I'm happy to be here and I'm just going to you know, be very brief. Um, it's um, uh, whenever a, an editor approves or receives a proposal for a special issue and then ultimately approves it, as I did for this one, you know, it's a it's a long process to to bringing it to fruition. And it's always so satisfying when that happens. And so since Max didn't do it, I'm, I'm going to hold up the issue because it really exists, you know. <laughs> and, and when Max and Dirk and Andreas and Abe, a real, by the way, guest editor dream team, if ever there was one, when they first floated the idea, that was at the uh, SPE meeting in Chicago in 2018. Um, and then they uh, ultimately turned that into a written proposal in early 2019, which I, I approved. Uh, in, in, I, we had the call, I think, drafted and out by March or April of 2019. Um, and they made the point in floating this proposal that work on political CSR is really where the conversation about deliberative democracy informs how we think about global governance actors. And, you know, it's a way to reconcile and integrate con contradictory values, which I think is really especially relevant as organizations become more, more complex. Um, the guest editor team persuaded me pretty easily that the time had come to take stock of this area of work and to look ahead. That's what special issues are perfect for. And the proposal that they came up with, it did cast a wide net, norm welcoming both normative and social scientific work, empirical as well as conceptual. And there is an empirical paper, to my surprise and delight, um, uh, and opened, of course, to various organizational sizes, forms, industries, and such. There were over 30 submissions from a dozen countries, which is a very healthy number for a BEQ special issue. And the six issues in the paper uh, in the issue are impressive in variety and quality, a, a real testament to the guest editor team who, who shepherded these papers along and whipped them into shape. And I want to say lastly, that when you look at the issue, um, do not skip over the guest editor introduction. In a lot of special issues in journals, those, those guest editor introductions can kind of be throwaways. You know, they're just going to say a few broad words about the topic and preview the papers and get on with their lives. Um, at BEQ, our idea for a long time has been that a special issue intro should be itself something sub substantive and significant. An article um, in and of itself, yeah, sure, preview the papers, but also make a contribution to, of its own. And I really think the one that uh, Max, Dirk, Andreas, and Abe came up with here is an exemplary example of what we have in mind. With economy and precision, they trace the history of PCSR and deliberative democracy. They chart the controversies. They locate the issue papers in that context. And they also even preview a way forward in the form of this new idea of distributive deliberative CSR. Honestly, if I were still editor, I'd be telling future guest editor teams to look at this one if you want a model of how to do an opening essay. 
So anyway, I'm delighted to have had a small part in this and uh, thanks for having me and I'll turn it over to Frank. Well, thank you. Welcome everybody. And uh, thanks for everything here. What can I say after Bruce? No credits fall on me. All the credits uh, fall on uh, the wisdom of Bruce for having accepted the proposal. All credits go to the guest editorial team for having done a wonderful job. Oh, <laughs> uh, credits go to all of you authors uh, for having prepared wonderful articles. So what can I say? I'm in my kitchen. This is late afternoon. I need to cook for my family. So I might pop out from the screen every now and then just to check if nothing is uh, going wrong on the on the furnace. Now, otherwise uh, than this, I think the topic is absolutely uh, excellent. You now looking, uh, looking at the debate about uh, CSR, it's all too often that it's being uh, instrumentalized. It has been for a long uh, time. And that is uh, all too bad because there's lots of uh, normative uh, questions. And then <clears throat> uh, some attempts to bring back uh, sort of this uh, normativity with the political CSR uh, thing has been, well, successful, if you like, in terms of uh, publications, but maybe not doing enough uh, for this. And so what I absolutely appreciate in this uh, special issue is that it tries to find ways in order to substantiate uh, the vehicles for bringing in other voices and making CSR a little bit more deliberative. So congratulations with this uh, effort. I think it should go back to Max. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Bruce and, and Frank. So before I hand over to uh, Irene for the first paper, I just want also to share uh, a few really brief remarks from the guest editorial team. Um, so for us, as Bruce mentioned, it's a, it's a couple of years um, uh, back now that we, we were thinking uh, that uh, deliberative democracy uh, needs, uh, the, the state of the debate in business ethics uh, needs taking stock and needs digesting uh, some uh, of the key contributions that have been made over the past decade. So we felt it, it was a good moment in time uh, to initiate this uh, special issue, particularly because there were sort of three uh, big um, topics that we felt um, have been either discussed uh, a lot or have come up in the deliberative democracy theory within political science. And so we're, we're not yet fully received in the business ethics community, but are hugely relevant. So the first uh, topic uh, focuses really on deliberation itself. It, it is a, a topic of big debate, uh, what it means, what it norm its normative standards should be in political science, and even more so once deliberation entered um, the business ethics debate, um, it was hugely debated uh, what kind of deliberation is, uh, would our businesses capable of, how should the normative standards be, is it even right to call for businesses to deliberate with affected stakeholders on social and environmental issues. Uh, and so in, in, we felt it's a good time to crystallize uh, this key debate um, and bring in sort of uh, a consolidated understanding of what deliberation means, um, as well as uh, um, show uh, some of the functions of deliberation that have not been explored in depth. We have focused a lot on legitimacy um, for example, in uh, the way we have uh, studied deliberation, but less so, for example, on the epistemic qualities of deliberation. So how, how does deliberation lead to better business decisions? Um, that's, for example, something that is explored uh, in, in articles and special issue, but not so much um, in the literature so far. The other big debate in deliberative democracy theory focuses on systems, adopting a systems view um, and mini publics as a key mechanism of the deliberative democracy on the micro level. And both of these um, phenomena have been big, uh, have driven a lot of the research in deliberative democracy theory, um, and they are slowly entering also the debate in business ethics. And we felt those are key developments um, that, uh, uh, that need uh, to be incorporated um, and really inf should inform how we look at deliberation in business going forward. And so adopting a systems perspective and viewing deliberation um, with different roles in different contexts in, on different levels within a system 
is key. It makes the debate much more complex going forward, for sure. Uh, but this is the kind of complexity we need if we want to do justice to the concept and also want to solve some of the urgent issues that, that uh, we still face in terms of global governance, what Frank uh, mentioned just before. And finally, the final point was uh, the role of technology. Um, so obviously, digital technology, um, uh, digital technology is very relevant, um, uh, but the research on a deliberation in a digital environment, um, online deliberation in particular, um, has just begun to take off. And so we felt it's also important uh, to focus attention uh, on that issue. And we also have a nice contribution uh, in the special issue around AI, uh, digital technology, and the role of deliberation for its uh, governance. And so overall, what we felt um, is sort of we, uh, we, we propose we should adopt uh, a fresh perspective on deliberation going forward in CSR research, which we call distributed, distributed deliberative CSR. Um, and the key focus really is about um, not uh, sort of simply viewing the corporation um, uh, as, as a state-like actor and simply uh, sort of um, putting the concepts of deliberative democracy theory into uh, the business context, but really looking at the role of deliberation on the different levels distributed across uh, business and deliberation as a system within a bigger system, obviously, of regulation. Um, and so as you can see, it will certainly inspire a more complex picture um, going forward. And, um, and we, we see this also in the contributions in the special issue uh, that we will hear now more about. But the good news is that some of these contributions tackle uh, these difficult questions successfully already. And we hope going forward, um, the field uh, will uh, move um, in, in this direction and addressing some of the key challenges that we face um, uh, in relation to deliberation in, in the business context. So with that, uh, I'm now happy to hand over to Irene uh, to introduce um, um, their contribution uh, to us. So please, Irene, go ahead. Thank you very much. And just so uh, one final comment, um, questions. We will, we will take all questions after the paper presentations are done. So please post your questions, absolutely do so. Uh, and we will do it um, after the presentations are done. Thank you. So Irene, floor is yours. Okay, so I'm very happy to uh, share uh, our paper, The Contingent Role of Conflict, Deliberative Interaction and Disagreement in Shareholder Engagement. It's a paper, it's an article, a project shared with my co-authors, Daniel Beunza, Fabrizio Ferraro, and Andrea Sopner. Daniel and Fabrizio are also in the room, so they are very welcome to, to join uh, in the discussion. So the project uh, actually dates back to many years ago. It was 2011 and I was in New York. Uh, and I had the chance to be there with my co-authors Fabrizio Ferraro and Daniel Beunza for an ethnography at the ICCR, the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, which is a coalition of investors, pioneers in the practice of shareholder engagement. Uh, shareholder engagement is the comprehensive process to which shareholders attempt to change ESG, environmental, social and governance, corporate practices and policies by employing a broad range of tactics such as writing letters, shareholder proposals and private dialogue. An adversarial relationship by definition, as you can imagine, and obscure by its nature because of the closed door process on which uh, it's based. Ever since then, our interest in framing shareholder engagement as a deliberative process that led to uh, a first article from my co-authors Daniel and Fabrizio published in 2018 on Org Science, in which they explored the dialogue on climate change between ICCR and Ford and General Motors, and they leverage Habermas' theory of communicative action to explain how activists and companies reach common ground in the process of establishing dialogue and framing the issue, uh, and uh, eventually, uh, which eventually allows for uh, deliberation. 
At the same time, I was starting working on my PhD thesis and with Fabrizio, my then uh, thesis director, I had the chance to join the uh, OICOS Academy um, in 2012. Uh, and while getting lost in the woods with the other participants, as you can see in the pictures and enjoying the beautiful nature in Switzerland where the Academy was held, Fabrizio and I met our uh, to become co-author Andreas Opner that you can see in the picture uh, top uh, right corner. He was charmed by our vision of shareholder engagement and he offered access to the global asset management company on whose data our analysis are based. So with this amazing set of co-authors and data, in our paper, we address the question of how the tension between, between conflict and consensus is resolved in a by-definition adversarial relationship, such as the one between executives and ESG-oriented shareholders, in order, in order to produce effective deliberation and concrete changes in ESG policies and practices. And we do so by seeing shareholder engagement as a deliberative process with three uh, stages, establishing dialogue, solution development, and solution implementation. And by building on interaction its traditions is in sociology, suggesting that this tension can be resolved at the level of the interaction and by considering shareholder engagement as a sequence of interactions. So two interaction is mechanism play different roles uh, at different stages of the process. And those are deliberative interaction, which refers to the ability of parties and actors to discursively engage in the exchange of reasoned arguments to resolve disputes and the voicing of disagreement. We use a proprietary database of 169 ESG engagements with US public companies over the years 2007, 2012 to test our hypothesis on the effect of deliberative, deliberative interaction as well as its joint effects with disagreements on the advancement of the engagement from the solution development stage to the uh, implementation uh, stage and from the implementation stage to the effective implementation of changes. And what we find is that while deliberative interaction by itself does not help advance the engagement process, it positively moderates the effect of disagreement in the solution development stage. Uh, because in this stage, disagreements might help parties in considering different points of view, analyze the issue more comprehensively, and reach a shared and agreed, agreed solution. At the same time, deliberative interaction amplifies the negative effect of disagreement in the solution implementation stage. Um, so blocking uh, the successful completion of the engagements. Uh, since at this stage, disagreements might call into question the progress that has been already made. It might undermine trust that has been built in this process and it's perceived as stepping back on an agreement already taken. So both corporate executives and engagement professionals might use our results to improve their ability to jointly address uh, social and environmental challenging by using conflict and deliberation wisely at every different step of the process. Many are the benefits and improvements to our article um, coming from the peer review process we experienced with BQ. And since, uh, as you can imagine, it's impossible to list all of them in this setting. First of all, we want to thank uh, our handling editor, Dirk. Uh, at the same time, also Bruce, who gave feedback on our uh, article. Uh, and both of them are representative of the other uh, editors as well. Uh, and we also thank the three anonymous reviewers and uh, the managing director, Joanna. Second, we want to mention three of the ma major benefits of the peer review process in our uh, case. 
So it helped us to nail down our contribution to the deliberative democracy literature uh, by uh, opening our gaze to recent perspective and approaches in deliberative democracy that we were not aware of, such as the contestatory deliberative approaches, uh, in which uh, the idea of meta-consensus meta from Arena et al, and the idea of sufficient justification for, for, from Schormeyer and Gilbert, both of them BQ uh, recent published articles. And so idea of meta consensus and sufficient ju justification as opposed to the achievement of rational consensus in traditional theories of deliberation. Second, uh, the process helped us to rethink the stages of our process model, link them to existing models on uh, different stages in stakeholder engagement, and make our process model a central part of our contribution, which in previous versions of the article was just instrumental. And finally, uh, it helped us to strengthen our methodological contribution as well by making the novelty of our methodological design, coding scheme, and manual a central part of the contribution to the study of shareholder engagement and more broadly, uh, stakeholder uh, activism. So we thank you all for the possibility to share uh, our journey and our paper, and uh, we are very happy to engage with you uh, in the discussion uh, afterwards, along with Daniel and uh, Fabrizio. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Irene. Many, many thanks. Uh, so, uh, Alexander, you, you are next. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I will try to share my screen. Um, yeah. and... One second. Mm -hmm. um, one second, sorry. Yeah, no worries. I'm yeah. actually at the uh, MacBook of my girlfriend, so it's uh -oh. uh, <laughs> kind of tricky if you're used to uh, Microsoft. Yes, um, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one second. Okay, can you see the screen or is it not working? No, uh, I, I I don't think you have activated it. Otherwise, we, we might. Oh yeah, now now it works. Yeah, yeah, it works. Okay, great. No. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, um, Alexander, please go ahead. <laughs> thanks. Um, so thanks for the opportunity and the great uh, possibility to present my paper here, um, and also to the editors for the great support during the whole process. Um, so the paper has a fancy name of uh, Islands of Deliberative Capacity in an Ocean of Authoritarian Control and the Deliberative Potential of Self-Organized Teams. It's a bit of a wordplay on a um, quote by Ronald Coase. Um, so I will just get right into it. Um, why did I pursue this research project? Um, I tried to identify basically two gaps in the literature. Um, the first one would be that the recent debate in political theory and political philosophy on workplace democracy hasn't paid, in my opinion, too much attention to the actual implementation of democratic practices in business firms. So there's a lot of talk about why we should democratize firms, but not so much about how we can actually practically achieve that. And the other kind of gap I identified, I think, is that the rate of democ democratic theory has mostly neglected the workplace. And I think this is basically rooted in this Habermasian distinction between we got the system and we got the life world. And in the system, we got market imperatives, which kind of are hostile to deliberation. And I mean, there's an exception, of course, with political CSR, which is kind of a bridge between business, business ethics and the deliberative democratic theory community. Um, but I think those kind of two gaps are, are what the paper tries to tackle. Um, and it does so by basically assessing the, the, the derivative capacity of self-organized teams based on a kind of empirical study of 16 in-depth interviews, which I conducted in six German firms. Um, and the paper basically um, is also reflecting on a paper by Andrea Filicetti, which came out in 2018, where he basically makes two theoretical claims. The first one is that 
films should be considered a necessary parts of a larger deliberative system. And the other one that we basically get two complementary strategies to democratize firms. And the first one would be stakeholder deliberation as something that's more oriented to the outside um, and the environment of the firm. And the other one would be workplace deliberation. And the paper focuses specifically on workplace deliberation. Um, so what are the key academic insights or contributions? I think the first one would be that we should conceive firms not only as necessary parts of a larger deliberative system, so, uh, but also as deliberative systems themselves. I also, this, I think this point is also well captured by Sabatis and Singer. And I think this perspective allows us two things. Um, the first one would be that firms are composed of smaller organizational units, which can offer favorable or unfavorable conditions for deliberation. So one could think of the board of directors, which might be more conducive to deliberation, while the assembly line might be not the right place to start a deliberative process about what we are doing. Um, and the second one is that it gives us also a normative standard to assess how deliberative process work in the firm. So in terms of do they perform an epistemic function, an ethical function, or a democratic function? Um, and it also leaves us room for kind of a con context-specific approach. Um, I think this is basically the, the advantages of the systemic perspective. Um, the second, basically, theoretical contribution the paper tries to make is that self-organized teamwork as a form of management technique um, has a unique potential to promote deliberative processes within firms. And I think so because of two arguments. Um, the first one would be that self-organized teams tend to equally share decision-making power which creates kind of a space for collective decision-making processes, which can take the form of deliberation or voting. And they also shape how employees interact on a daily basis, which I think sets them apart from, for example, the board of directors. Um, so they have a tremendous impact on how people work on a daily basis. Um, what are the empirical um, contributions or insight that the paper provides? Um, so the papers, gives us kind of tentative evidence that self-organized teamwork can create space for authentic, inclusive, and consequential deliberation within firms by basically suspending hierarchical control structures and granting greater collective autonomy over their work to, the, to employees. And, and also basically insights that came from the, the interview material that I, um, that I kind of analyzed was that the deliberative capacity of those self-organized teams crucially depended on certain factors. Um, there was one that highly structured and moderated team meetings had a positive influence on the inclusiveness. Um, also, a, a significant role played the status of the team in the larger organizational hierarchy. Um, so if decisions could be easily overruled, that was basically bad for the deliberative capacity. Um, also, the absence of coercion or in, informal hierarchies was something that was positive for the deliberative capacity and the openness and access to information basically positively influenced the authenticity and inclusiveness of the deliberative processes. So overall, I think that the paper provides tentative evidence for the feasibility of workplace deliberation. And I think it also suggests that some of the common objections that one, one might raise against deliberation in the workplace might be overstated. I think the it's not necessarily excessive transaction costs that are associated with deliberation, and it's not always too time consuming. And sometimes it's not only instrumental deliberation that's going on with firms. So there might be some kind of slack in the market, so to say, for, for deliberation. Um, so yeah, what did I learn from the peer review process? Um, a lot, it takes some time. And I want to thank Abe especially for his great summaries always of the reviewer comments and also the anonymous reviewers for the, for the insights. Um, specifically, I think a takeaway for me was that um, making those mythological limitations of the paper more explicit and addressing the kind of head-on. Um, the paper has a fairly small sample size. There might also be some social desirability bias in the interview answers that I got. And I didn't rely on actual transcripts of the actual, actual deliberations um, that took place, which I think could be something that future research should tackle maybe. Um, so yeah, that was one point the reviewers pressed me on. And the second one um, was to look more specifically how workplace deliberation is constrained by the environment of the firm, specific, specifically um, 
financial objectives, the organizational efficiency that firms need to um, uh, need to have to to survive in the market, and how those kind of constraints affect um, the democratic and ethical function of deliberation within firms. Um, I think since I probably don't have much time left, the last point would be uh, since it was the first paper I submitted to a peer review pay, uh, journal. Uh, it's not very smart to submit something that's very close to the word limit already, um, because there's going to be a lot of comments by the reviewers, <laughs> and it's hard to uh, fix that if you don't have any space left. Um, yeah, and that's basically it, and thanks for the attention. Many thanks, Alexander. Thanks for, for sharing your, your paper uh, insights. Um, so, Sebastian and Simon, you are next. Um, please, the floor is yours. And Alexander, can you stop screen? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, Simon will share the, the screen. Yeah, perfect. Great. So um, we're going to present the two of us, uh, our paper, which is called The Role of Deliberative Mini Publics in Improving the Deliberative Capacity mm -hmm. of Multi-Stakeholder Initiatives. And I'm going to get to, to you know, defining these, these terms in a bit, but first I want to acknowledge my, my co-authors, my great co-authors with whom we worked on that paper, Simon Peck, who is going to present the second half of, the, of this presentation at the University of Victoria, uh, myself uh, at the Hertie School in Germany, and Brent Lyons, who unfortunately cannot be here, uh, but is located at, the, at York University in, in Canada. So, um, First off, I would like to summarize the, the, the paper, just uh, the paper in a nutshell. Essentially, it is about conceiving of multi-stakeholder initiatives as deliberative systems to better understand how uh, deliberative mini-publics can improve, um, can help improve multi-stakeholder initiatives. And I think, uh, again, a number of definitions are, are necessary here. When we speak about multi-stakeholder initiatives, we're thinking about uh, private governance mechanisms that involve different actors, uh, public and private actors, especially firms, uh, corporations, essentially, but also nonprofits, academia, trade unions, uh, actors like that, that all together elaborate rules, most often in a deliberative fashion, uh, rules for corporate conduct, such as standards or guidelines, for instance, on human rights or working conditions in, in supply chains and with which uh, firms that participate in these multi-stakeholder initiatives comply uh, voluntarily. Uh, so being a, a, a very uh, large instrument for global governance and for the governance of, of global business activities, we focused on these MSIs and uh, we essentially first see them as deliberative systems. And, and Max and Alexander have already talked about the, the system's perspective, but essentially it's about seeing a polity, a political institution, not as something monolithic, but as being made of different elements uh, within which there are different degrees of deliberativeness right, or deliberative capacity. So to give an example in the context of, of MSIs, in, um, you have, for instance, the public sphere, which can be the different stakeholders that are affected by the issue that the MSI is trying to regulate. But you also have the empowered space, uh, which essentially are the formal institutions like the General Assembly or the Senate that govern uh, the initiatives. So, so conceiving of MSIs as deliberative systems is helpful uh, in order to understand where the deliberation, sorry, lie within MSIs and to understand how we can improve MSIs. So in the second step of the paper, what we do is that we design, um, we elaborate design parameters as we call them to adapt the notion of deliberative mini -pub publics to MSIs. And deliberative mini publics are essentially forums, deliberative forums in which randomly selected people um, um, engage together in facilitative deliberations about a given political topic. And uh, oftentimes uh, a, a specific type of, of uh, deliberative mini public is called citizen assemblies, which people are more used to, which is uh, quite prominent in uh, issues like um, you know, developing a plan for climate, uh, climate change in a given city or um, to deliberate around, around Brexit, for instance. Um, so, so really what is innovative about deliberative mini publics is that they are, uh, they select uh, stakeholders, if you will, or people, citizens randomly in order to make them deliberate about a specific problem. And so we see how we can adapt this, uh, this 
democratic innovation essentially to the context of MSIs through a set of different uh, design parameters. And finally, in our paper, we develop a, a systematic model to, uh, to understand how such deliberative mini publics can address deficiencies, in particular in, in terms of deliberative capacity in MSIs. Uh, now I'm going to go into the, the different questions that we've been asked to, to answer. Uh, why did we pursue this research project? As I mentioned, essentially, uh, there are a lot of failings of MSIs in terms of how they govern global business activities. There have been a lot of reports on how, uh, you know, elaborating some rules for corporate conduct are good, but in, in fact, in terms of their actual impact, in terms of the, the actual impact of the regulation, there's nothing uh, changing on the ground, right? Uh, these, these codes of conduct and the standards still allow for uh, human rights violations and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, what we observed as well is um, that some developments in, in political philosophy and especially in deliberative democracy, but also in practice, uh, were only partially leveraged by management and organization studies and especially by CSR, sustainability and business ethics research which is also something that Max emphasized in, in the introduction. So coupling these two things together essentially led us to focus on uh, how one particular democratic innovation, deliberative mini publics, offers some prom promise, promising ways to deal with some of the, the problems that MSI face. So essentially that was the motivation under the paper, uh, of the paper. And then uh, talking more about the, the theoretical contribution of the paper, we um, um, essentially build on that deliberative uh, systems perspective, which allow us to open the black box of MSIs and show, as I said before, the variety of deliberations that take place, place sorry, within, but also without, outside of multi-stakeholder initiatives. So conceiving of, of uh, MSIs as deliberative systems allows, for instance, to understand that uh, it's not just the MSI in itself that is, that is poor in terms of its deliberative capacity, but for instance, that it may lack inclusiveness in a very specific area of the initiatives. So for instance, uh, it may lack uh, inclusion in uh, its formal institution, what the deliberative systems perspective would call the empowered space, right? Or it may lack authenticity in the way uh, uh, the different stakeholders transmit their claims to the formal institutions. So the transmission between the public sphere of the MSI towards the empowered space of the MSI in uh, deliberative systems terms. And second, uh, our main, uh, uh, second main contribution is bringing the notion of descriptive representation, which is core to understanding deliberative mini publics to, uh, to MSIs. And by uh, leveraging this, this descriptive uh, representation um, characteristic, we essentially bring a complementary form of non-electoral representation to better understand how MSIs can better un, uh, uh, represent stakeholders and their, and their interests. And here too, some, some definitions are needed. Um, first off, uh, what is descriptive representation? Uh, it's essentially uh, the representatives uh, or the, the deliberators, if you will, on deliberative mini publics that stand for, for themselves rather than for uh, uh, representing a, a constituency, right? Which is oftentimes uh, what happens on multi stakeholder initiatives. You have some sort of structural representation when one particular actor or representative represent, for instance, uh, unions, trade unions, or um, environmental NGOs and so on. So bringing the present, uh, representative, uh, sorry, descriptive representation allows to, uh, to uh, divorce the representation from uh, these, these different structures. And by randomly selecting uh, representatives, we bring in supposedly more uh, uh, descriptive representation of the different interests at work. And just to give a, an example on, on what that actually means in practice, it means that instead of, for instance, inviting the CEO of a big company and the president or the chairman of a, of a large NGO to deliberate of, uh, over the rules of a multi-stakeholder initiatives, we would randomly select uh, people from that corporations and people from that NGO, and of course, from the other stakeholders involved in order to deliberate about these rules, which uh, again, according to the theory on deliberative mini publics and descriptive representation would allow for a fair, more adequate and a more just representation of different interests on, on multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, and now Simon will take over. 
Uh, thanks, Ab. Uh, so just uh, very briefly, some contributions to practice and lessons learned. So, so building off the theoretical contributions, we think that MSIs like the FSC, for example, could use insights from this paper to do a kind of systematic analysis of the deliberative capacity, not just of the entire system as a whole, but of specific elements. So that can be re really useful to pinpoint, for example, uh, inclusiveness is problematic in the public space, and that's really the issue that has to be tackled. Uh, secondly, they could use mini publics in a targeted manner based on that kind of diagnosis, which, which I think is a promising tool that can add a lot of value, as, as Sebastian mentioned. Um, and then uh, it's also very important, and I'll mention this on the next slide, to translate these, these political science tools to the context of multi-stakeholder initiatives, where we have things like individuals and organizations as well. So those design parameter, parameters that we were we were thoughtfully guided to address, I think, are really useful for as hands-on advice for an MSI. Now, in terms of lessons learned, uh, we, we learned a lot. The review process was, was intense, but extremely developmental. So thanks to Max for, for all the thought you put into helping us navigate through this and, and, uh, and shifting the specific focus of our paper. Uh, so the probably the biggest lesson we had was just the benefits of, of actually taking this fine-grained view of an MSI. So instead of looking at it as a system overhaul, really looking at the specific elements of it. And that was a really, really great insight. Uh, also, the benefits of using an illustrative case throughout. Find, we found that just using the FSC as an illustrative case made it a lot easier to focus our arguments and for readers to understand kind of what the flow of our, our ideas is. Um, benefits of having uh, tables and figures. So we thought everything was crystal clear, but we could see how it's important just to have some means of organizing all these insights so that a practitioner, for example, could look at it and, and see their own organization there and be able to use the ideas. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, just the benefits of really not importing, as Max said, but translating uh, this type of innovation from a different discipline to a novel context to make sure that it's fit for purpose um, and that it can actually be used and, and the theoretical insights are relevant uh, given the unique characteristics. So with that said, it was a very developmental process. Thank you to the reviewers if you're here. Um, and yeah, we're happy to have any questions afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, many, many thanks, Sebastian and, and Simon. Uh, uh, so next uh, is uh, Christian. So please, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, by the way, really, really cool also as an author to see on what everyone is actually working on. And for me, it's kind of like also now actually eye-opening because the pieces fit actually nicely together. Um, so it's good to have the bird's eye view. I hope I share correctly. Good. So um, my colleague Alex, Alex, by the way, wants to say hi. He cannot be here, unfortunately, today because he has another audience tonight. He has an audience of small little kids. Um, it's understandable maybe that um, you have to bear with me. Um, so our uh, thought in this issue is on essentially on political CSR and the idea of how to facilitate deliberation about technology, which is to a degree very boxed off, black boxed, a little bit removed from deliberation. So as a little bit of background, and I think that's not new to everyone, we are kind of like seeing a bit of a area of tech clash, right? Where we as a society are not quite comfortable where things are going, how we are governed, how we are governed, I have to say, through technology, right? That we have a number of companies who might, um, might have outsized, not necessarily influence, but undersized scrutiny, right? So where uh, there is this undercurrency of what are we developing? How much input do we have uh, with uh, technology? Um, the interesting thing about technology to our minds is not only that there's power in technology, but also the very nature of some of these technology of artificial intelligence, especially more contemporary forms of artificial intelligence, such as machine learning, and deep learning. To use, again, a very um, maybe contemporary example. So I guess we are all familiar with the discussions around ChatGPT. that's kind of like all the work for, uh, over the last few weeks, right? And us kind of like realizing, okay, that's actually quite an interesting technology, but also one which has flaws, right? What you see here is, for instance, one of the many glitches which this technology has, for instance, 
ChatGPT arguably amazing in terms of what it can do compared to other things, but it sometimes glitches in weird ways, right? That, uh, for instance, it gets a very interesting personality if there are certain keywords which it ask has something to do with kind of like how the technology is generated. But for uh, the argument that, frankly, kind of like also the reviewers and the editors helped us to develop, um, it is to us interesting to look at in how far deliberation around technology, especially around technology, which is not that clear to everyone in the end uh, involved, and how far deliberation can also have an epistemic power, right? Um, applied to the example which I just showed, essentially not every developer, how can they be, right? Kind of like by um, developing something which has so many edge cases might be aware of that it has quirks and features, but um, arguably there is a lot of eyes then in society that can point even developers to saying, okay, there's something not really working out, right? Or there are things which are actually harmful to us or to certain uh, publics. And um, what we try to um, describe here is a process where um, arguably between developers, uh, also um, coming back to Sebastian and C.S. Simon's argument, also mini publics uh, may be helpful in um, yeah, kind of like developing technology better. That on the one hand feeds into political CSR and also in a discourse which we're having around responsible and explainable AI, which is more like on the technical evidence-based side. There's also emerging discussions, of course, about responsibility. But I think what this special issue and kind of generally our discussions also around deliberation bring to the table around discussion on technology is also this idea of accountability and this processal corrector, all right? Kind of like this idea of we might not be able to figure everything out at once, but through essentially the, <laughs> it now sounds maybe a little bit whimsical, but through the power of discourse, right, of the ideal of rational communication and the processes that in, in come through that, um, we uh, might be better in figuring out also things which are not immediately open to inspection. That I have to admit that is something which amazingly the editors and the reviewers also had to um, actually massage out of our original argument, this idea of having a more processual, a more lively, less static kind of like approach to things. The argument goes, um, it, kind of like also coming again from a Habermasian, more um, um, ground of good communication uh, tradition, this idea of okay, what could be ideal communication um, principles such as participative, right? That kind of like essentially um, we have the ability to participate no matter what your, your background of having some type of comprehensibility, having a multitude of waters, but also having some type of responsiveness. And what the argument then later develops is essentially, and like also something which we see in other um, works in this issue, this idea of how can um, discourse be organized around certain spheres where there's maybe in a certain sphere, uh, more technical expertise, but not lived experience with that technology, right? And what we try to propose or try to describe is essentially an interplay of um, spheres, public spheres, for instance, who might be good in finding glitches, finding power differentials to the people that can actually change that experts. And then the middle layer of uh, mini publics that um, can uh, do translation work, right? And essentially what, um, and again, that's not only on our show, it's more kind of like a, um, essentially well, what the uh, process made us think about better see, right? Through the reviewers and the editors is to um, develop a more, um, a, a processor approach to deliberation, which is, especially that practically relevant when it comes to the ongoing policy um, discussions on how AI should be governed. And that this tends to be somewhat 
tending towards aesthetic right principles and so on and so forth whereas deliberation obviously brings also a good perspective in terms of yeah having a, a processual view on that and that is I think I can keep that very short. I think that is something which we really appreciated in the whole process and that we, I think, originally had much more of a static, boring thinking about deliberation, right? This idea of kind of like this has to fit into neat boxes. And the thing which I think we think kind of like really, really enjoyed in this process is in that um, you, you normally always think about business ethics quarterly, you have to be like really, um, this is so strict, this is so whatever. No, no, no. Um, I, well, what I really enjoyed is that it actually made the whole theorizing very lively, very processual. I'm looking a little bit for, for good words, but um, I find um, everything which essentially when the issue actually collects, it's not a static, boring in type of boxes, uh, type of theorizing, but it's one which is think very yeah very very alive which i really enjoyed in this whole process thank you so much let me also just stop that one thanks a lot thanks a lot uh, uh christian for for sharing a brief overview of your paper yeah and last last but not least uh, we have um a paper for uh, on effects and online stakeholder engagement um so the floor is yours um i don't know if you present it uh, together or um Yes, so thank you okay. very much, everybody. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I've, um, I'm going to, to present this paper and let me share the, this screen. Uh, okay, so this paper, uh, it's co-author with uh, David Loper, uh, who unfortunately is not able to be here. Uh, but I'm going to try to tell the story as, as best as I can, um, representing him as well. So uh, this story, as I was telling you, is um, it was born out of a collaboration with David, my co-author, who's in, in the picture. And uh, the story is that we were, it happened that we were selected by Google Launchpad to develop a tool, a detection engine tool uh, that uses AI, uh, artificial intelligence on, on the basis of um, uh, some, some um, uh, Google um, methodology. And this tool wanted to, uh, or is aimed to kind of detect and understand emotions online. So David and I were invited by Google to develop this tool. And um, we spent several weeks in, in Malaga, where Google has a site. And um, basically, um, we were very interested on understanding what's the role of emotions in, in hate speech and how hate speech is developing. Um, but we were also very interested in, in understanding uh, whether everything that uh, happens in the internet, as it is mm, often said, is uh, hate speech. And if, if there is mm, engagement that also happens, that can be constructive. So uh, together with, with my co-author, um, and this is the second part of the story, is that um, I, I've been working on, on a case, on, on the case of plastic pollution for the last 15 years. Um, and basically I had the opportunity uh, after finishing my PhD to, to go to California and spend a year there. And I met um, amazing people that were leading the transformation of our thinking on plastic pollution. And I don't know if you remember, but 15 to 20 years ago, we were all thinking that the um, solution to plastic pollution was going to be recycling. So we were all very focused on recycling. But um, uh, what, and corporations and other big institutions were kind of doing uh, all the, the, the kind of the framing and development of, of their products related to uh, recycling. Um, but 
for me and during the, the years something very interesting that i i learned is that everywhere in the last recent in the in the last five years maybe uh, everywhere i go even in the big supermarkets in the big um uh, looking at the, the corporate um uh, publicity the this frame uh, has has started to change and corporations are talking about reducing plastic um, about not using plastic anymore and so uh, I could hear the echoes of what my friends um, in in the NGOs in California were saying and so for me it was very interesting to understand okay so the, these frames are evolving so corporations are incorporating some of the frames of um of the ngos um and and how this is happening and uh, the question was like is this uh how the internet has helped to develop this kind of new shared framework of of plastic pollution um and so basically we wanted to understand if there were engagement and if the liberation was possible in the internet um, besides all the studies that say that in internet mainly what is happening is that there is hate the speech confrontation etc so um what what we started to do and this is the third part of this of the third uh, kind of main element of of this paper is that um, I was very passionate about the the literature on on the liberation um, and agonistic pluralism in this case, um, and especially reading Chantal Mouffe and, mm -hmm. and this paper is an homage to to Chantal Mouffe in a way, and and her work. Um, uh, also, uh, I have to say to, to the work of uh, Cedric uh, Dawkins, who has initiated the, the kind of the reading of Chantal Mouffe in, in the management literature. So um, the, the third step of this paper, in a way, so the first step is the collaboration with my co-author, trying to understand what's happening in the, the internet with emotions. The second is my kind of knowledge of the plastic pollution and kind of the, the intellectual curiosity of how how happened that these frames are kind of the, the NGO and the corporation frames that were so, so uh, distant in the 2000s now are kind of um, uh, intertwining and they are converging in a way. And the third step is kind of this um, this theory that helped, helped me to understand a little bit more what was happening in, in this convergence of, of frames, right, in the internet. So we took these uh, readings of Chantal Mouffe. I really enjoy reading everything about Chantal Mouffe for this, this uh, paper and looking at uh, how we can conceptualize um, um, the liberated democracy and, and the liberation in another way from this um, uh, perspective of Chantal Mouffe that is very much on political theory, but that can be, a, can be applied also to, to management uh, studies. Mm -hmm. And so we, we work on developing agonistic pluralism uh, as the basis of our theoretical um, framework. And basically, what we do is uh, we develop um, the importance of emotions in, in this framework of um, um, agonistic uh, deliberation. And we push uh, Chantal Mouf uh, in saying um, how kind of um, emotions and passionate exchanges are at the basis of uh, a new way of understanding um, these um, kind of these engagements, right? Um, and how emotions can foster and not only destroy constructive engagements. Um, so basically, with all this, we we try to look at the data. We look at the data, and basically, our research question is, was how can stakeholders mobilize effects. Um, to to change hegemonic discourses because what we are 
trying to understand again is like how these NGOs were able to convince the corporations in introducing a frame that it was very against their uh, their principles because this frame was about refuse. So this is almost about thinking about the growth in corporations, right? So. And uh, basically, what we did is we we look at um, we look at data. And thanks uh, to David. David is an amazing engineer, um, data analyst, um, and he collected um, tweets from the last um, fifteen years on the all the key actors on, that I I knew I was able to map on on this field of plastic pollution. And, and we kind of uh, together with my knowledge, because I've done uh, plenty of interviews and, and naturalistic observations in the issue in the field of plastic pollution, we were able to, um, to put all this together. Uh, so understanding the tweets and based on the overall understanding of the field of plastic pollution. And we created a methodology that it was using AI, artificial intelligence, to uh, at the service of qualitative thinking or qualitative exploration. And basically we inter iterate between David, the AI person and my knowledge and my readings of the tweets and my knowledge of the field in order to come up with, with um, kind of a frame, uh, a theoretical frame uh, on the basis of the data. So what we saw is that these NGOs, um, have been trying for the last 15 years, have been trying to kind of change the frames of corporations, but also other NGOs. And basically what they've, they've done, and we conceptualize it in, in two kind of in two basic uh, strategies. So with the um, NGOs, what we, they've done is a more typical mobilization strategy based on <clears throat> the mobilization of uh, moral effects and solidarity effects. This is kind of stimulating the moral chaos um, and questioning the previous moral positions, but also solidarity effects that it's including others, right? Um, with corporations, which is probably the most interesting thing, what they've done is uh, doing this strategy that we call inclusive dissensus. Um, and it's basically related to kind of uh, stimulating moral effects but uh, instead of kind of in a friendly way, as they were doing with the uh, NGOs, uh, by shaming and blaming the adversary and reinforcing their moral position uh, on how kind of corporations were doing the wrong thing. But instead of creating polarization, including the adversary, which is the corporations here, in the conversation and celebrating a common approach to the adversary. And, um, and basically, this is what we found that it was a strategy that we could trace on the on the uh, on the tweets of uh, our NGOs, um, and and that in our um, in our view helped um, to kind of reframe the the corporation's idea on what should be done with plastic pollution. Okay, so sorry, oops. And basically our contributions, so we, sh we basically uh, we contribute to the conversation on deliberative democracy, showing how conflict is uh, important, um, understand conflict in this deliberation is important because our frame is based on agonism and on conflict, uh, but understanding as well how affects emotions constitute the dynamics of change of the discourses of responsibility. And we propose this, this framework on inclusive dissent and, and emotional dynamics, right? That activists use, sorry, I don't know why, but um, okay, so this keep going. And so this is our main contribution. And, Mm, for us, it's also uh, interesting to think about the implications that this is having, this research is having. Um, and I would like to, to first make a note about uh, our method. I think our method is already a, a contribution. In fact, we're writing another article about um, how this paper is helping, has helped us to kind of uh, use AI at the service of quality 
qual qualitative exploration um, and, and so on, how can AI, how AI can help others, in fact, to, uh, um, to develop uh, qualitative exploration and, and informed theories. Um, so I think the, the method is already quite interesting. Um, but probably most importantly in, in what we are first able to understand is that um, how how dissent works online and disentangle just the kind of the conversations about fake news that are very important as well and about uh, polarization that are very important, but understanding that uh, online platforms can also be uh, a space for engagement of changing frames um, and how how this happens over time and what are the mechanisms that we have to think about if we want to change frames in other global challenges, for example, uh, climate, climate change and, and others. Um, and this is helping us to also to think about climate change in a, in a new way, right? And so it's helping us also to and develop new new research about how frames are changing and how we should push frames in a way. Um, and basically, um, what have we learned also from, from the review process? Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to, to say thank you so much to Dirk. Uh, it was an amazing, an amazing process of, of review and he helped us, he believed in on us when it was a quite complex uh, paper um, and he helped us to push very much on on theory without forgetting the complexity of, of our paper so really matching um, the the theory and the complexity of the theory and and refine it and making sure that we had this, this elaborated theory that could help kind of go beyond move and um, um, but uh, having the the empirical case uh, totally aligned, so uh, I think that that was uh, kind of our main learning from from this process. And we thank Dirk and and the reviewers, uh, the anonymous reviewers, for for this. We we really enjoyed the uh, this process. Thank you very much. And we have to thank. Thanks a lot. So, thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot, Itzia, for, for um, closing our um, session of presentations. Um, thanks to, to everyone for sharing uh, your research. Obviously, doing this in 10 minutes is quite tough. Uh, certainly, we are all aware of that, but I think it, it was a great overview of the exciting scholarship that is part of this special issue. Um, so thanks uh, for, for, for preparing this. So we have a few minutes left uh, for um, uh, discussion. So um, if there are any questions uh, amongst the, the uh, um, authors here uh, or in the audience, feel free to, to come forward. Um, I think what we, what we uh, certainly have seen is that um, uh, these papers um, tackle uh, some of the key problems um, that need to be addressed, but obviously we do not have all the answers yet. I think they also show um, how much still needs to be done if we want to adopt this uh, systems view of deliberative democracy in, uh, for uh, the business ethics um, discussion. And I think this goes for deliberation within firms. Um, and I think there we, we have seen that um, a lot still needs to be studied and also in relation to multi-stakeholder initiatives um, where I think we have seen a clear case for um, insights from many publics being able to be leveraged for multi-stakeholder initiatives or also for tackling um, the complexity of AI systems. And so certainly um, uh, we feel that uh, these papers greatly reflect the direction we would want the scholarship to go. Um, but I also um, uh, certainly think it shows um, uh, that there is still a lot that needs to be studied in, in this field. Um, so uh, we hope that the special issue overall um, really uh, pushes uh, the research in this area forward. Um, and we hope that sort of direction um, uh, that the issue uh, charts is one that is fruitful going forward. Um, 
So probably um, uh, we can ask Frank if uh, his meal is proceeding well. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I, I, I think it's probably a good um, time then uh, to close um, the session so that uh, we we stay. Is there a raised hand? Um, then please go ahead. I don't see the raised hand, unfortunately. Ah, OK. Frank has, has a raised hand, uh, so please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely presentations and wonderful to learn a little bit more about the background of all these uh, different papers. I was taking some notes uh, while listening, um, uh, <clears throat> but I suppose that uh, the uh, the last presentation by Itzia sort of uh, preempted any question here because I was uh, going to ask about uh, the role of emotions in uh, deliberation and the role of uh, dissensus and conflict in uh, deliberation, but I think that's uh, already uh, addressed. So. Maybe one sort of a silly kind of uh, comments, but I noticed that if you look at the uh, all the uh, authors, that the large, large, large majority are all from Europe. I think uh, Simon is from uh, Canada. And then I don't think there's anybody else from outside of uh, Europe. And I was just wondering, what does what does that mean, if anything, for deliberation? I think, I mean, if, if I may, I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to say, um, of course, there, there seems to be a pattern here in, 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 in this special issue, but on the other hand, you know, I, I always recall, um, the great work that Aken Fang at, at the, at the Kennedy school in Harvard has done on deliberation. So I think the discourse is also alive, you know, on the, on, on, on the other side of the Atlantic, so to say, um, what I realized is that we actually that the discourse has shifted towards empirical material, which is very welcome, I think, you know, if you look at the, the deliberation discourse, communicative action, Habermas, 15 years ago, also in the CSR business ethics field, um, I mean, it was almost exclusively conceptual. And now we see, and I think this uh, special issue shows this, um, we start to engage empirically with this, uh, um, with this phenomenon. And I think this is very, very welcome um development which also puts us um uh, quite close to where the discussions are for instance in political science where this has been researched empirically in a in a uh, for, for a long time so um kudos to all the to all the authors um i really enjoyed uh, this webinar and i really enjoyed all your insights i think um, we really pushed the debate here Yeah, thanks, thanks, and, and Andreas. I, I also would add that I think the debate probably, uh, obviously, we have some uh, big uh, philosophers uh, very relevant for deliberative democracy uh, coming from Europe. Uh, Habermas being obviously one of the key names, but obviously, if we look into the political science, I think the debate is very, very international um, already, and it's not uh, um, only European focused. Uh, I would say. So overall, um, I think the field um, is uh, probably not as Eurocentric um, as it seems uh, in, in, in this discussion, but maybe in the business ethics field, um, I think, yes, probably there is um, um, a certain focus uh, on this uh, in, in Europe. Um, but I also think um, the, the concept certainly um, will, um, will be relevant um, also going forward for, for, for more and more scholars. Uh, and hopefully the special issue contributes to that as well. And we should, of course, realize that Abe is uh, from Chicago. Yes. <laughs> One um, of the guest editors. I, I'm, I'm from New York. OK, <laughs> I'm from New York. okay. Uh, I happen to live I'm in very Chicago. sorry. <laughs> no, no, but I was just going to add to that. I think it is. I think what Max was getting at is really important because, of course, there's a lot of North American interest in deliberative democracy, just not in the B school. And I think that relates a lot to um, the foundations of normative business ethics in, in the different locations. So in North America, it's been grounded a lot in analytic, moral and political philosophy, whereas in Europe, I think it's taken its cue more from sociologically informed critical theories. And so you get, you know, Habermasian and Lumanian approaches to business ethics, which are interesting to be schools in Europe, but it hasn't had the same sort of uptake because people are, you know, reading Rawls and stuff or, you know, not that you guys don't read Rawls, right? But that, but that's like where, where it's, it's sort of taking its cue in that regard. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that's a good moment uh, to conclude um, this uh, webinar. And obviously uh, we conclude this with a few thank yous. Um, 
First of all, um, um, on behalf of the guest editorial team, I want to thank um, Bruce uh, and Frank for their, their guidance uh, and support throughout the process for believing in the proposal um, and now helping us also through all uh, of the different stages of the process. That obviously also uh, must include uh, Libby Scott um, and Joanna for helping us with uh, the managing side uh, of things, the more technical stuff. We learned a lot uh, of uh, the process uh, as well, and they were very helpful. Then a big thank you to all of you here um, and also all the authors who could not join the live session. Thanks for the hard scholar, hard work and the great scholarship you put into this. Uh, so I think it became clear um, that you all put a lot of work into, into it, uh, also throughout the review process. And it's great um, that, that you, you um, have put that work in. It was worth it. And we have now, I think, a great uh, issue and important contributions. Um, and then I also want to thank the reviewers uh, because they were uh, a key part um, in bringing this uh, special issue to the quality level it now has. Uh, you all mentioned it in your presentations. I think we were very lucky with very engaged reviewers throughout. Uh, and so it was a pleasure to, to, to work with them. And obviously there's a lot of work that goes into this as we all know. Uh, so thanks also to, to all uh, the reviewers uh, for their help. So that um, then concludes uh, the session. Um, thanks uh, for attending um, and uh, Okay, the, I just, I'm just seeing a comment here. Um, it came in a bit late, so maybe we can, okay, it's still on the, um, yes, on the focus uh, in terms of where the scholarship is located. Yeah, there is not enough input from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, I, I can see, and, and the global South, I think. Um, Certainly, uh, that that is uh, something for future scholarship uh, to engage in that debate. So I, I think it's, it's certainly a welcome comment. Um, okay, um, so I, I guess we probably leave it there. We are five minutes over uh, already. So thanks uh, for, for attending. Um, and hopefully now um, people can enjoy reading uh, the different articles um, and have a great weekend. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Max. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks.